So we've spent some time talking about adaptations, generally defining adaptations. We've also spent a lot of time in this class thinking about experiments and looking at experimental results. Right now, we're going to specifically talk about experiments as tools to assess the adaptive significance of traits. And we're really gonna focus in on experimental design and how a good experimental design allows us to effectively test our question of interest. The great thing about experiments is that they allow us to isolate a single aspect of our system and test its significance. The downside of experiments is that they require some manipulation and are not always plausible. So maybe it's not ethical to do an experiment to do the manipulations that we want to do, or maybe it would be difficult to do those manipulations with a sample size that's large enough to yield a meaningful result. So there are some limitations to experiments, uh, but when possible, they're a really useful tool. If we're going to look at this system, another observation, we've been out in the world and we've noticed that these flies, Zonosomata vitigera flies, have these banded wings. We've noticed other flies that don't have wings like this. And so we're curious, what is the significance of this trait? Is it just through chance that this trait arose? Is it some kind of adaptation? Does it increase the fitness of individuals that have these banded wings? Now, all individuals in the species look like this, so we're going to have to do some manipulations to create some variation so that we can test the significance of these wings. Not only do they have these banded wings, but this particular species of flies also waves those wings up and down. And they do that when they are confronted by a predator like this jumping spider. So we're wondering why do these flies have these banded wings and why do they wave them up and down? We've also made some other observations that help us toward a hypothesis. We've observed that some of the spiders that prey upon these flies also wave their legs up and down. Um, and why do these spiders wave their legs? Well, we've done experiments that show us that they do this to defend their territory. So spiders are using leg waving as um, a within species cue to protect their territories. So maybe flies are using this wing waving to trick spiders into thinking that they're dealing with other spiders and then leave them alone and not eat them. That's maybe our idea. So we like that idea. It's plausible, it's cute, it's interesting. Maybe we just wanna accept it and move on, but no. We're curious and thorough evolutionary biologists and we need to test this explanation even though it is plausible. So our question is why do these flies have these wings? Well, that's a great question to get us started, but what we need to determine our experiment is a really precise question. So we need to phrase something a little bit more clearly. And here is the question we're going to use. Do wing markings and the action of wing waving mimic these threat displays of jumping spiders and thus allowing flies to escape predation. So do the wing markings allow flies to escape predation? And is this something that's specific to predation by the jumping spiders, these other spiders that do their waving? So it's a multi-part question. Are the wing markings and waving um, related to fitness? And are they related to fitness in the context of not getting eaten by these jumping spiders? So it's a complex question, but it's a precise question. And with that clear question, we can then design an effective experiment to get to our question. Our next step is to develop some reasonable objective explanations or some hypotheses for our system. 
Okay, so we have the first hypothesis that the wing waving and wing bandedness is a response to reduced predation from jumping spiders. Maybe here's some alternative hypotheses. Maybe this isn't a mimicking behavior. Maybe there's some other reason. Maybe it helps them attract mates, or maybe it helps them in some kind of competition with other individuals of their species. Maybe the flies are mimicking these jumping spiders to deter other predators. Maybe there are other predators that look at the fly and say, oh, you're a jumping spider. I don't want to try to eat you because I don't want to deal with a predator, another predator. Um, and then the hypothesis that we're most interested in is maybe the flies are specifically mimicking the jumping spiders to deter the jumping spiders. So these are our alternative hypotheses. And then what we need to do is design experimental treatments to test each of these hypotheses separately. The best experiment we could, so we could do multiple separate experiments for each of these hypotheses, but the best, most convincing thing that we could do would be to design an experiment that would allow us to test all of these hypotheses simultaneously. And then each of our tests isn't confounded by having happened at a separate time or with a separate group of predators or flies or other different conditions. If we can test all of our hypotheses, our contradicting hypotheses in a single experiment, all the better. We want to manipulate just a single factor in our experiment. In this case, we have two things that we're interested in. We're interested in uh, wing waving and wing bandedness. So what we really want is a array of experimental treatments where each one manipulates just one part of that, either bandedness or waving. Okay. So in our natural population, we don't have flies that have unbanded wings or that don't wave. So we need some to be a little bit more creative to test our question and to design these treatments. So here's what we're gonna do. Here are our four treatments labeled A through E. In one treatment, we have the flies in their natural condition. In treatment B, we have flies where we've cut the wings off and then re-glued the wings. And that sounds a little barbaric. Um, with insects, we're allowed to do these kinds of things. Um, okay, so we would have anesthetized the flies so they're not flapping around under a microscope with really fine instruments. We would have cut the wings off and glued them back. Now, why in the world would we do that? Let's look at the another treatment, treatment C. Here, we're taking house fly wings, which don't have the bands, they're clear, and gluing them to our flies of interest. Now, this is going to allow us to have a treatment where the flies are flapping their wings or waving their wings, but the wings that they're waving are not clear. But we've manipulated these flies. We've We've cut the wings, we've put glue on them. So it's possible that what's happening to the fly is maybe a result of having the surgery. Like maybe they're more likely to get eaten because they underwent this procedure. Um, maybe they're less likely to get eaten because the predator smells the glue and is deterred by that. So B allows us to control for having had this surgery. So we expect, if there's no effect of doing this surgery, we expect the same result in A or B. A difference between A and B is going to tell us that something is happening to these flies that has little to do with bandedness or waving and more to do with this surgery. Okay. We're also going to have kind of the reciprocal of C, which is D, we're gonna take house flies and put on our banded wings. So these won't be waving, but they will have bands. So we can see just the effect of bands here, just the effect of waving and C. And then in E, we're going to have just plain old. So with our treatments, we have a purpose for each one. We're using each of these treatments to 
test one specific factor separately. So you might want to pause for a moment and reread over the purposes of each of these treatments. With each treatment, we're going to, for each treatment, we're going to collect data. And before we do that, we should think about our prediction, what specifically we expect to see in our treatment if our given hypothesis is accurate. So we're going to measure something in our experiment. And our controls are going to allow us to say whether differences among our treatments are due to the factor we're interested in or maybe something else. Our first hypothesis is that the bandedness and the waving has nothing to do with predators and has all to do with something else. So our first hypothesis, no mimicry occurs. We have two types of predators. We've got the jumping spider, and we're going to have other predators like assassin bugs, praying mantises, other things that eat flies. We're going to observe the fly together with the predator and say, does the predator attack? Does it stalk the prey but not attack the prey? Or does it retreat? Does it avoid the prey, the fly? So if there's no mimicry, if these wings have nothing to do with uh, protection from predation, then we expect for all of the treatments that the predators are going to attack the flies. If this is a situation of mimicry and it's not that the flies are um, communicating with the jumping spiders, but rather that other predators are seeing the flies, thinking that they look like jumping spiders and then avoiding them, we're going to see um, A and B causing other predators to retreat. So other predators are going to see this waving and this bandedness, think it's a jumping spider, and retreat. Our third hypothesis is that specifically this has something to do with jumping spiders. And in that case, we think that in A and B, just the jumping spiders will retreat from the flies that are waving their banded wings. The other thing implicit in here is that we're thinking A and B are going to be the same. If A and B are different, that tells us that there's something about our surgery treatment that is maybe causing an effect. All right, so then the next step is to collect our data. And we also have to think not just about our treatments, but the way that we're collecting the data. So uh, the way that they did this experiment, they uh, starved the spiders first off. And then for each spider, they introduced it to each of these types of flies. Now, if we did each spider in the same order every time, maybe they're getting full. And by the time they get to E, they don't attack the type E because they're full and not because of anything else. So to get around that, they randomized the order in which each spider was exposed to a fly. So some got A first, some got B first, et cetera. Totally random order. So that we're assuming that what the spider does or what the other predator does has nothing to do with its um, hunger or the order in which it saw the prey. The other thing that we need to do is randomize which um, individuals within A, within B, within C that we give to the spider. Like if we just happen, if we've got a fly sort of flying around in a cage and maybe we catch one and that's the one that we give to the spider, um, maybe there's something about that fly that made it more easy for us to catch and thus made it more easy for the spider to catch it or made it less daunting to the spider. So we need to be also standardized in the way that we choose individuals for each treatment. So we've thought about our treatments, how we're treating the flies and what flies we're giving to the spiders. We've also thought about it from the other direction of how are the spiders and the other predators um, interacting with 
the flies? In what context are they doing that? Uh, we want to make sure that the spiders just don't happen to be full every time they interact with an E spider or really hungry every time they interact with an A spider. So we're controlling not just what the predators are seeing, but what the predators are like when they see that particular prey item. And we've collected these data, here they are. We've got response to the jumping spiders, response to other predators. And you can see for the other predators, they didn't do all of these um, control experiments. So let's look at other predators first, looking at the hypothesis that this mimicry is not related to jumping spiders, but is related to protection from other predators, that other predators are seeing the flies and uh, avoiding them because they think that they're jumping spiders, or maybe they're not thinking, but they're responding as if the flies are jumping spiders and avoiding them. That doesn't look to be the case. Whenever other predators see any fly, they attack and kill it. It doesn't matter if it's waving its wings that are banded. It doesn't matter if it's waving wings that are clear. It doesn't matter if it's just hanging out like a regular house fly. Other predators are eating these flies. So the bandedness and the waving is no fitness benefit for the flies. Let's look at then interactions with jumping spiders. So over here with E, we see that there's never an opportunity or a time when jumping spiders retreat from the house fly. They never retreat from the house fly with the banded wing. So this tells us that there's no protection. Well, they don't never. They very rarely retreat from the house fly with the banded wings. This tells us banded wings all on their own, not a great protection from jumping spiders. And here, C, similar results to D, very rarely do jumping spiders retreat from a fly that's waving clear wings. So just waving all by itself doesn't seem to be um, yielding a fitness benefit. B and A, we see really similar results, which one tells us that there's minimal effect of our surgery treatment. And two tells us that there is a benefit Jumping spiders are really likely to retreat from flies that are waving their banded wings. So this tells us, this supports our hypothesis that flies, Zonosomata uh, vitigera flies are mimicking or have evolved this trait, which mimics jumping spiders and protects them from predation by jumping spiders. This is consistent with our third hypothesis. So all of this together reminds us of four keys to a really robust experimental design. One key is that we have defined and tested effective control groups. We have designed our experiment in a way that isolates one or more specific factors so that we're really just testing the effect of the thing that we're interested in. Okay, so for our experiment, we were really just interested in banded wings, waving wings, or the combination of banded and waving wings. And so we needed five treatments to get at just those three variables. We need to handle all of our treatments equally. So this is where we um, mixed up the order in which the spiders saw the flies. We were random with which particular fly went to um, in which order or went to which predator or which type of predator. Handling our treatments equally allows us to avoid bias and increase precision. So bias is what happens when our results are influenced by something that we're not actually testing. So when maybe our results are fairly uh, close together, precise, but we're totally missing the bullseye. So this would be a small bias. We've got some variation in our results, um, but we're close to the goal of testing the factor that we're interested in. Here, um, 
our results are clumped together, but they're pointing toward an answer that's totally far off from what we were testing. So maybe this is that we always gave um, E group flies last. And so we're seeing that, wow, spiders actually retreat from house flies. It's amazing. What is it about house flies that uh, um, scares away jumping spiders? Well, it's nothing about house flies that scares away jumping spiders. It's that the spiders are full and they're not interested in eating, right? So um, handling all of our treatments equally and in a random way allows us to um, really key in on the factor that we're interested in and also increases precision. So precision is um, when our results are clustered around um, our question of interest. Um, and so in this scenario, this cartoon, we have a really low precision. Uh, our results are all over the place. We uh, sometimes spiders um, avoid our treatment A flies, and sometimes they immediately attack our treatment A flies. So we've got a wide variety of responses and really can't say anything from these data. Okay, and then down here in the bottom corner would be high bias and low precision. We really can't say anything from these data. All right, so handing our treatments equally allows us to avoid bias and increase precision, increase the likelihood of finding a significant result and finding a significant result that's specifically related to the thing that we want to be testing. Um, related to all of this, randomization is really key to equalizing um, miscellaneous effects, right? So designing our treatments um, controls the effects of the things that we're really interested in and the things that we're not interested in, but randomization is also important to control things that we're not even thinking about, that we haven't even thought about. Okay, like um, maybe if we did a variety of experiments at different times of the year, maybe spiders are influenced by the amount of sunlight that they get or something like that, right? Things that we're not really even thinking about or not interested in. Randomization helps us control for those kinds of factors. The last of four, repetition. We need to do um, our experimental treatments more than once. We need more than one fly of type A interacting with more than one spider because individuals just normally differ from each other. Maybe some spiders, maybe a spider is ill or particularly young or particularly old and is gonna respond in a, in a way that's not characteristic of the whole species. So if we want to uh, make a generalization about a species, we need to measure lots of individuals. So this reduces the effect that certain outliers might have on our data. Um, it helps us understand how precise our data are. So how, if we only had one data point, we wouldn't have any idea about how good of a representation, representation this is of the whole population. We have lots of data points we can see. Are they clustered around each other here on the top left? Are they spread really far apart from each other here on the bottom left, right? So having repetition allows us to get a hold on how precise our data are, how much variation there is in our data. All right, so that's all for experiments. The next thing to think about would be observational studies where we're not directly manipulating something, but using natural variation that already exists and collecting data to answer a question about adaptive hypotheses.